Welcome to the Simplify Season 4 bonus episode. I'm Benjamin Stoller, and I just wanted to drop in and say thank you. Thanks to all you out there who listen to Simplify all over the world. You've helped us get on the map, and the fruits of your efforts are so visible now. I mean, since we got over a million listeners earlier this year, which still blows my mind, so much has continued to improve. We've added Terrence, Nat, Ben Jackson, and in the meantime, Odie, Caitlin, and I still get to keep working on this really incredible thing. I mean, we've been shortlisted for the podcast of the year now by Future Book. You can check out old episodes now on Salon. We have more and more resources available on the Blinkist magazine, and we're cooking up a stellar season five with more of what you guys love. So I just wanted to say thanks. Thanks for listening. Thanks for sending us emails, for your reviews, likes, comments, and for your support. Now, quickly to business. Today, we have another bonus episode. So if you're new to Simplify, yes, we do say six episodes, six ways to change your life. But the bonus seventh episodes are where we feature someone who maybe isn't as well known as our other guests, but who we think has a smart, important, and helpful approach. Someone we think you should know. So today we're going to meet Lavi Ajaye. And if you think there's someone out there we should talk to, just send us an email. We're at podcast at Blinkist.com. So with that, let's get into the episode with Caitlin and Terrence. Welcome to Simplify. I'm Caitlin Schiller. And I'm Terrence McGee. Hooray. Back in the studio again. Um, we're here today to talk about... Um, or talk about the work of a lovely person named Lavi Ajayi. She is a writer, a humorist, an activist, and a self-professed troublemaker, the best of all titles. Uh, she has a podcast called Rants and Randomness, which is where I first heard of her. But today we're talking about her book, which is called I'm Judging You, The Do Better Manual. Sounds kind of harsh. Isn't really. <laughs> what drew you to her and her work in particular? Well, I said that I first heard about her from her podcast. The fact is that I first heard her on her podcast, but our awesome production assistant, Nat, was the person who brought her to to my attention. Yay, Nat. Hey, Nat. Heard about Lovey from Nat, and I listened to her podcast and immediately was really um, really drawn to her voice. Her actual sonic voice is, is very warm and lovely, but so too is the space that she creates. She, she rants and... It, it can have some sort of some kind of vigor behind it. But she also leaves makes this this beautiful, warm space in which her interviews happen. Um, she often talks to uh, people from the African diaspora in the U.S. doing really, really interesting things. One of the interviews I really enjoyed was with the editor of Essence magazine. And I recommend that one if you go listen to Lovey's work. But I liked her voice in all the senses. And then I picked up the book and thought she'd be a cool person to talk to. So what this book is about is it's a lot of stuff. It's humor essays. She talks about people's wigs. She talks about bad manners at family dinners. But between all of that stuff, there are sections that focus really hard on social issues. And it's here where she gets to the heart of her message, which is really get uncomfortable and tell the truth. Um, that it's our duty and can be a joyful duty to be really real with each other and hold each other to higher standards than we do. And that might involve telling somebody some uncomfortable truths. I was really struck by the simple power of her message. You know, we can take for granted the ideal of truth telling and doing right by ourselves and by others. But we, if we don't insist upon these ideals, it's really easy for them to erode. And so I really appreciated that. And even with the title of her book, she calls out an obvious but uncomfortable truth. We judge each other. Mm. And since nobody likes discomfort, she uses that powerful tool of humor to kind of coat the discomfort. And it reminded me of, the, I think it's Flannery O'Connor, but the darkest truths are best told uh, with a punchline. So good. And I think she's kind of epitomizes that message. She totally does. And it's, I'm judging you, but it's, I'm judging you with with a smile and an elbow in the ribs that lets you know that not she might be judging you and telling you something that you don't want to hear, but she's judging you and telling you something that you don't want to hear because she thinks you can be better than that, which is what real friends do. So without any further ado, should we just listen to the interview? Let's do it. Cool. Hi, Lovey. Thanks so much for taking the time to to come on Simplify. Could you introduce yourself, please? I'm Lovey Ajayi. I'm a writer. Um, I wrote a book called I'm Judging You, The Do Better Manual. I'm a speaker on all types of topics related to uh, pop culture, media, race, and business. And I am a professional troublemaker. I have a podcast called Rant and Randomness. Essentially, I am a Jill of all trades 
master of few. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Um, I think that's probably one of the best things to be in this day and age, honestly. It gives you some flexibility. Um, Absolutely. What is your way of helping people to do better? It seems like it's to to just call them out and let them know someone's watching them. I wrote this book in a way where it felt like you were at brunch with your best friend who was telling you that, like, yo, I think you're better than what you're currently doing. So a lot of the feedback that I've gotten about the book is, like, people don't feel scolded. You literally feel like you're talking to a friend of yours who's just, like, Girl, let me tell you how you can get it together. <laughs> because yeah. I've been where you've been. I was this person. I'm not judging you without love. Like, this is with love, but I want you to be a better person. For us to fix any major problems that's happening in the world, we're going to have to get uncomfortable. Like, people are so afraid of discomfort. It's crazy. People would rather sit in injustice than discomfort. So it's like, how about we all just get used to the idea that some things are not going to feel comfortable and harmonious. And but for things to get better for the greater good of the world, we're going to have to, like, get prickly and feel the wincing times of having weird conversations with the person you love who's telling you what that thing that you did was not okay, or being told, hey, the group that you're a part of has been a part of like the global web of oppression for centuries and just Mm -hmm. being able to understand that like discomfort will not kill you. (laughs) Yeah. It will not kill you, but it's necessary for growth. It's like how, like when babies are teething, how they're crying for two months because the teeth are trying to poke through their gums, same thing. Mm -hmm. And then they get teeth Mm -hmm. and they're all good. They can chew food, (laughs) But (laughs) but they have to go through that piece before they can get to the other side so people are just so afraid of that piece that they'll 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 back out of anything before it gets uncomfortable have you been in a situation where where you've confronted someone from um or you've called someone called someone out on bad behavior and they weren't receptive to it some people will not always be receptive to your loving criticism or critique and that's okay but I think our jobs is less to worry about like how will they receive it and more to figure out how do you want to make sure it comes across like I think our jobs is less about the landing and more about like making sure we've done our part in the way that makes most sense because if we're always worried about how people will receive it we will do very very few things so that's why I always say that like, I use my checkpoints like whenever I'm I want to ask somebody something or say something that feels scary or or do something that's going to make something a situation uncomfortable somebody uncomfortable I always ask myself um, my three checkpoints is do I mean it can I can I defend it did I say it with love and if the answer is yes to all three I say it and hopefully the person that you're talking to receives it in the way you intended it to be received those are that's that's like really good practical advice actually (laughs) yeah Um, what do you think people's trouble is with with receiving criticism um because it makes you stop and say like oh wow i actually have to adjust something that i already Mm. do so Mm -hmm. it's that adjustment, like having to make any adjustment as a person is not comfortable and it's not easy. Like usually when somebody calls you out on something or, you know, says, hey, you could do this thing better. It means you have to make a certain shift like, oh, this mm-hmm. thing that I'm doing, I haven't been doing it perfectly right, which means I have to change the way I've been doing it. And it's not easy. What have you been called out on and had made a change? You know, like, there are times when I'm more blunt than people are used to. So, (laughs) yeah. I mean, a lot of times I stick with what I say, but I've been called out for, I think, like, once I was called out for, like, how I said a particular statement. And I was like, oh, okay, I see how you can, I I see what, how that could have not worked for you. And I will make sure I'm even more thoughtful moving forward. But getting to that point is making sure you kind of take ego out of the thing, right? Like, you have to be able to kind of check yourself, too, and be like, okay, 
make sure it's coming from not trolls online, but people who actually love you and respect your work really have to pay mm -hmm. attention in those times when those people are the ones who are giving you crit um, criticisms. Um, and just understanding that life is about making adjustments along the way. Critiquing you is not being like, you're a bad person. It means you made a misstep. And hopefully you see that, take it on, and then make an adjustment and keep it moving. Learn a lesson and keep it moving. I think that people get so focused on succeeding that they forget that part of what succeeding is is failing. Yes. Like, you can't expect to succeed without making any fails. Like, I don't know anybody who's successful who's never failed. That's kind of crazy. Like, failure is part of life. It's it's just a thing that you have to deal with. Part of the way that you, you self-identify is as a troublemaker. What does that actually mean to you? You know, I think troublemakers are disruptors and, and people who kind of shake the table a little bit. And um, I feel like I'm a disruptor because, you know, I'm often the person who says what people are thinking but dared not to say. So in that way, even that makes me a troublemaker. So it's kind of like, oh, okay. But it's not like my goal isn't to make people uncomfortable funny enough. My goal is to say what I am what I feel in the way that I feel it, in the way that I mean it intentionally. And what I find is people who tell the truth, who are very super committed to telling the truth like me, end up coming across as troublemakers. People were like, oh my God, I can't believe you said that. But you were thinking it. You just happened to not say it. Have you heard of this 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 Buddhist concept of fierce compassion? No, but I get it immediately when you say it. It's a concept that sort of changed my life. It's the thing that's given me any relationship with my dad whatsoever. But it's um it's kind of another way of finding yourself into this very Christian idea of loving your enemy, which can be really hard. But the idea of fierce compassion is that you create justice not through revenge or inflicting cruelty and like equal measure upon your enemy or somebody who's done you harm, but by holding them to account, asking them to be better than they have been. And it's I, I felt like that was the place that you were coming from in your book yeah like I, I I'm somebody who considers herself an optimist mm -hmm. so when I see the world going to hell on a handbasket I'm always like I expect it better of us so how do I make sure that I'm doing my part to make sure we're expecting better of ourselves and for me essentially this book which which is why I called it the do better manual um the importance of it for me was to kind of tell people like, look, things can be better, but we kind of have to make it our business to make things better. I think if we all told more truths, we'd be in a better world. If we told more truths to each other, to ourselves, we'd be better for it. What What is one thing that you would like people to, to do better at in general? What's an idea that you'd like to leave listeners with? You know, it's just a simple idea of, it's so funny. You guys, you're going to be like, you already said that, but I mean it. Like, making <laughs> it a point to just tell more truths. Like, it means challenging mm -hmm. yourself to always say what you mean. So people start honoring your word more if they realize that you're impeccable with your word. Like, you being able to stand by your word means a lot. So, yeah, I I just I do my best not to lie. I'm not saying I am a perfect truth teller, but I do my best to make sure that I am not walking through the world misrepresenting myself, misrepresenting my ideas and being somebody that I am not. I do my best at it, and that's all we can do. Thank you so much for uh, yeah, thank you so much for taking the time to talk today. It's been really a pleasure to to hear your thoughts. My pleasure. This has been a great conversation. I um I love having interesting chats with people who ask interesting questions and you just ask me some really good ones. So thankful for that. Oh, thank you. All right. Um have a great one. Enjoy enjoy your day in Chicago. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Bye. Welcome back to the bookend, where we end with books. I like it. You're perfecting your own kind of bookend rhythm. I got it right this time. <laughs> I don't know that it was wrong <laughs> last time. We have to ask Ben for his uh, his honest opinion on how the bookend intros are. That's true. Yeah. You could give us a little grade. Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. That was that was cool. I really enjoyed talking with Lovey. Yeah, like you said, she's got a great voice, great energy, really lively, and a really simple but powerful message. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And... 
to interlock with some of the things that that we talked about in the conversation there, one of my favorite mm, concepts, I guess, which is such a cheesy thing to say, one of my favorite ideas is the idea of fierce compassion, which I think that I might have mentioned on a previous episode. Uh, but it's a Buddhist concept of exactly what Lovey's talking about. Um, fiercely holding one another accountable in a loving way because you believe in the, in their inner goodness and ability to be their absolute best. Um, I first heard about it from an episode of On Being, endless shout outs to Krista Tippett all the time. I heard this episode on Fierce Compassion. I think that the, the episode's called Love Thy Enemy. And it really is the thing that has given me um, a relationship with my dad. He and I have had a difficult relationship. And if you're listening, Dad, you know that I say this with love, too. Um, it's been tough. And what this idea of fierce compassion brought brought to me was that it was OK for me to tell him that I wasn't satisfied with how our interactions were anymore and that I wanted more and always had. And the fact of the matter was that once I got brave enough to do that, it came to light that he did, too. And we had this long, really honest conversation um, in which tears were shed on both sides. And um, and we both pledged to do better by each other. And I think that at, you know, 33, I have a better relationship with my dad now than I ever had before. And it's because I was given this tool to understand our relationship could be different and come from a place not of anger on either one of our parts, but on belief that we could be better than we were. Were you afraid to hurt his feelings by being Absolutely. honest? Absolutely. Yeah. And I was afraid of being uncomfortable. What was it about fierce compassion that you felt like gave you a tool to kind of overcome your own fear of hurting his feelings and make you feel like you could be honest without it being coming across angry or misinterpreted or leading, escalating it to something worse. I think because it put me in touch with my own, the compassion portion of it put me in touch with my own desire to make, to make everything better all the time <laughs> and, yeah. and to make things better through empathy and being kind rather than being angry. Angry is something that I, I guess I'm a wussy about a lot of times. And it gave me a way to channel my anger into a, an, emotion and a way of being that was more productive for me and made me better able to communicate with him. That makes sense. And I think that fear of hurting somebody is the biggest barrier to truth telling. So what books did you um, pick that kind of were relevant to Lovey? Relevant to Lovey. All right. I've got two. Um, the first one is Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race. Hmm. It's an excellent book. It's by a black British journalist. Her name is Rennie Edo Lodge. Um, it takes you through the history of black Britain, starting with the London race riots of the 1980s, and it dismantles the myth of race blindness. Um, it talks about concepts like positive discrimination, which is a way of creating opportunities via looking purposely to include people who are unlike yourself rather than remain blind to them or exclude them. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just, it's informative, it's detailed, it's fair, and it's full of information that we all either need to learn, white people like myself, or see reflected to us in today's cultural climate. Sounds great. It's really, really, really great. Mm. How about you? Why don't you do yours? I pick Trickster Makes the World or Trickster Makes This World. Ooh. Um, it's by Lewis Hyde. He's most known for a book called The Gift, but this one is about the myth of the trickster in like Scandinavian, African, American Indian culture. And I picked it because <clears throat> Lovey introduces herself as a troublemaker. And I think of her method as almost um, trickster-like in that she's holding two opposing ideas, not dissimilar from your fierce compassion. Mm -hmm. um, and Lewis Hyde kind of looks at those figures in our culture everyone from Frederick Douglass to Allen Ginsberg as people in the culture who are kind of making people feel uncomfortable and creating ambiguity in the service of some kind of larger truth. That sounds awesome. It's a great, you know, Lewis Hyde goes down so many rabbit holes and does such a comprehensive look at the idea of the trickster. It's one of those like amazing reads where you feel like you've read 10 books in one. <gasps> 
That sounds so great. I, every time you have a book recommendation, I just want to take it from you immediately. Terrence makes the mistake of bringing his physical <laughs> yeah, copies, and I just want to yoink them. I'm not going to let go of this one. This is, this <laughs> okay. is one of my favorite. I'll have to go get it myself. <laughs> oh, very cool. Thanks for that one. Um, we'll give you one more to round it off. And this one is a little bit more office world. Uh, it, we can totally go there with this topic, I think. It's called Radical Candor. Oh. It's by Kim Scott. Have you heard of this one? Uh-uh. Okay. It's fairly new. Um it advocates for being radically honest, not brutal, but radically honest, because this fear of hurting people that we've talked about can create the most suffering. Hmm. There's this example of um, how when Kim Scott was working as a manager at Google, she had just given some sort of presentation and taken questions from the audience after. And her supervisor approached her later and, and said, hey, you know, you did really well with this, this and this, but you just undermined yourself via all those ums you used. Somebody who is as smart as you are shouldn't be doing that. So find a way to fix it. It's going to make you way more powerful. And she was kind of blown back by it. But then she went and she worked with a, a public speaking uh, coach and found that her her talents improved immensely. So she advocates for giving people the gift of being really, really honest in a kind way because it allows them to work on something in themselves that they don't necessarily see. And I think people appreciate you more when you're honest with them if it does improve their performance or yeah. their you know, any part of their life. Yeah, because it also makes you feel safe with them. Yeah. I mean, when you're with someone who is dishonest, it's you feel extremely unsafe and you don't really know what's true or not. So even yeah. a compliment is kind of worthless yeah. because you're questioning whether it really means what it means. Absolutely. I actually think that that has a lot to do with why it was so wonderful to talk with Lovey and to read her book mm -hmm. and the space that she creates in her podcast, you know that because she's being honest with you, it's safe to just be yourself and make a mistake. Mm -hmm. And that is so, so critical because it's not that she's holding you in judgment negatively forever. It's that she's going to tell you it's wrong and then wait for you to fix it because she believes you can and should. Yeah, that's a great combination. Cool. I guess, um, I guess that's it. Should we uh, take it out? Yeah, let's wrap it up. As you probably already know, but if you don't, here it is. Simplify is brought to you by Blinkist, which is an app. We pick out the key ideas from the world's best nonfiction books and distill them into smart, effective overviews that you can read or listen to in about 15 minutes. We made a voucher code for this episode. You can go try Blinkist and read um, at least two of the books that we just recommended, Radical Candor and Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race. Um, on Blinkist. So go to Blinkist.com slash friends and type in the voucher code TROUBLEMAKER. And you can try Blinkist for free for 14 days, which is more than long enough to read both of those books and more. This episode was produced by me, Caitlin Schiller, Terrence Mickey, Nat Ishkina, Ben Schumann Stoller, Ben Jackson, and probably Odie Constantino in there somewhere. We're not really sure he's totally back from his Cypriot vacation yet. He got stranded on an island. It's a really long story. Um, as always, we love to hear from you. You can tweet me at, at Caitlin Schiller, Ben at Bisto. And uh, Terrence, if you want to talk to Terrence about his book racks. Terrence uh, underscore Mickey. Yep. Um, or write to us at podcast at Blinkist.com. We live for those emails, or I do. Um, it means so much to hear from you and to hear what we're doing wrong and what we're doing right and what you want more of. So write to us. All right. That's it. That rounds out season four. Thank you so much to to everybody for, for supporting us, for listening, for recommending, for giving us your ears. We know that you could be listening to other things, and we're so glad that you spent your time with us. Um, and thanks to everybody within Blinkist, who, who's, without whose support, the show wouldn't get made. Um, yeah, so I guess that's it. We'll be back with season five and more adventures for your ears in early 2019. So yeah, in the meantime, write to us, say hi. And till then, this is Caitlin checking out. This is Terrence checking out. <laughs>